as we said, my name is Sterling Crockett, and uh, I am the uh, CEO of the Chesapeake Bay Roasting Company. Uh, Chesapeake Bay Roasting Company is located about 21 miles from here in Crofton, Maryland. Uh, we are roasters of uh, premium blends of coffee. And we set out to, uh, you know, achieve our goals and objectives as a company uh, in a manner that involves us uh, respecting everyone that's in our supply chain, uh, including those that are on the, uh, on the front end of our process. And so we are uh, very wide users of uh, fair trade organic coffees. We also, also um, set out to establish ourselves as one of the world's greenest roasters. And so uh, we start with our roasting process and we've deployed equipment that uses 70% less energy than the traditional uh, coffee roaster. Uh, we turned our attention to our packaging and we are the only company out there right now that packages our product at retail uh, in a steel can, which is manufactured by, with recycled steel. There's a recycled paper logo on the can and it's produced with soy-based uh, inks. Uh, we're also leading the way as a company in, uh, in November we will introduce the first uh, recyclable, uh, sustainable uh, K-Cup. Uh, everybody's uh, you know familiar with Green Mountain the K-Cup and its popularity. Well, as a company, uh, we, we sacrificed some revenue and margin uh, to stay out of that game because we felt very strongly about our convictions of being green where we, where we could. And lastly, uh, you know, as a company, um, as Reverend uh, Yearwood was speaking, there, there was a couple of things that struck me, and one was this word, to empower. And that's what we, we set out to do as, uh, as a company as well, to empower communities to uh, help themselves. Uh, I think um, I've had a lot of discussions with, uh, you know, friends and colleagues, and uh, I think people are growing weary of having things done to them and for them. You know, they want to do for themselves. And so, you know, we, we are very proud to be, you know, leading the way, you know, as a company through our 2% uh, uh, gross sales uh, give back to communities to address uh, issues involving uh, water in their communities. Uh, so today I'm also joined by a very, very diverse, uh, you know, group of uh, panelists and we hope to have a very spirited, informative discussion today, uh, you know, about diversity and how it uh, impacts, uh, you know, matters of the environment. So first, uh, I'd like to say each of the panelists will take six or seven minutes to speak. We'll let them get through their presentations and then at the end, uh, we'll allow time for, uh, you know, some questions uh, and discussions. And so, first I'd like to start with my good friend, uh, Ronnie Galvin. Ronnie, he's the Executive uh, uh, Director of Impact uh, Silver Springs. Um, Silver Spring, I should say. Ronnie grew up in, Mo in uh, Miami, Florida. He lived in the community where children were loved and elders were revered. I borrowed this from your website. I was wondering. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. And, and, and I know these are your words. It, it was like one big happy family, play cousins and all, borrowing from Ronnie. We owned our community, not just the houses and land, but also the process of determining our collective destiny and quality of life. That's power, folks. That's power. Uh, Impact Silver Spring was founded in 1999 uh, during the revitalization of downtown Silver Spring. The concept of impact was born when its founders developed a community-wide leadership program designed to bring people together across lines of differences for relationship and skill building. Ronnie will share with us his views on building a thriving community. Oh, so it's my turn. It's your turn. Okay, all right. So, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, pleasure to be here on the panel. I know two out of three panelists, and I just met uh, Sarah. Um, and Reverend Mark, with all due respect, Tacoma Prez is a wonderful congregation. Uh, but Rev, if you got a church somewhere, let me know. <laughs> let me know, let me know, let me know. Um, so, um, as Sterling said, and thank you, Sterling, for those kind words, um, we are a community building nonprofit here in Silver Spring. Um, and when you think of community building, many things that come to mind. Um, for you know, architects, developers, urban planners, folks like that, for the most part. Um, 
uh, people think about the buildings in the community, and that's important. We call that the hardware of the community. But our not little nonprofit, little scrappy nonprofit on uh, Piney Branch Road, uh, we're more in the business of the software of the community or what's happening with the people in um, the community. And in a place that is as, as that has been and is becoming as diverse as Montgomery County, it's our contention that uh, living in a place like this uh, just doesn't happen by happenstance. That to live in a community that is as diverse as, as ours takes a particular worldview, uh, a particular mindset, uh, and a level of will. Uh, because crossing lines of difference because of how we have unfortunately been socialized um, is not something that we do um, automatically. It's something that we have to do with a level of intention. And so our nonprofit really is in the business of helping people build the skills to live, work, play, pray, and do whatever else we do in our wonderful community together and, to, and especially to do it across lines of difference. The technical term that we use um, is we build community-based social networks. And we just, uh, re so think about Facebook or Twitter in real life with real people. Uh, and uh, we just, right, it's crazy. And it moves very fast and it's unpredictable, right? And our funders are like, but I thought you said you are going to do this. Yeah, but the community said they wanted to do that, so we got to go this way. But, um, and we recently changed our, the last line of our mission statement um, so that we are building community-based networks that ignite inclusive local economies and vibrant uh, communities. And so I'm gonna hurry up because I can't wait to get to the Q&A. And by the way, if no one has said it, today's session is being, uh, we have uh, simultaneous translation uh, happening um, so that everybody can participate in the conversation. Um, and so let me just tell you a, a quick story. There's a book out there. Uh, some of you probably have read it. Um, I'll talk about impact later. You can go to our website, www.impactsilverspring.org, and you can learn all about us. I really want to get down into this discussion about diversity and diversifying the movement. Um, um, there's a book out there called uh, What Then Must We Do by Gar Alperovitz. He's with the Democracy Collaborative over at the University of Maryland. He's basically saying that our, well, we know this, right? We're watching what's happening in D.C. Our economy, our government, our community is in trouble. And we all know, some of us it's way back in the deep recesses of our minds, and others it's right in front of our face. We all know that something is broken. We can't always define it, but something is clearly broken. And there's one statistic, y'all probably already know this because y'all are smarter, faster, and swifter than I am, but um, there's this one statistic that he said that really caught me uh, off guard. And I knew that it was happening, but I didn't understand what was happening to this magnitude. He said, 400 is greater than 180 million. There are 400 people in our country who control more wealth than 180 million people in our country. That is not sustainable, right? And there are all kinds of issues of race, class, privilege, power, history, um, influence that, that, that keep that equation in place. And so, Reverend, when you talk about a movement, I'm really thankful that you've helped frame what we're talking about in that, uh, what we're trying to do in that context. And so, you know, 400 is greater than 180 million, big national number, right? We're thinking, of, you know, something's wrong in America. Well, let me just tell you about Montgomery County. I've been here for three years, and it's taken me uh, uh, three years um, knocking on probably about a thousand doors, 300 of them, uh, up 29, make a right on Briggs Cheney Road, and it's a bunch of black folks out there. And I, when I first moved here from Atlanta, because Atlanta's full of black folks, full of black folks, right? And I asked, I asked, I said, where the black folks? Where the black folks? And they said, oh, we're not that kind of community. We're all blended together, so on and so forth. Well, the hermeneutic of suspicion in the back of my head said, there's some black folks together somewhere, <laughs> right? And so, lo and behold, there they were, right up 29, right now in some other pockets. So we went knocking on doors, we did some research, and here's what we found east of and west of 29. West of 29, right around Briggs Cheney, uh, large census tract there, majority white, somewhat diverse. 
east of, uh, of 29, and I'm almost done, east of 29, um, major overwhelmingly majority black, um, and butting up against that place that no one in Montgomery County really wants to talk about, Prince George's County, right? As a matter of fact, the neighborhood is called Prince George's West from time to time. Y'all know what I'm talking about. And so, and so we did some demographic research just trying to figure out what's, what, what, how do we compare these neighborhoods? Here's what we found. We're in Montgomery County, right? Y'all say right. 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 Uh, we're in Montgomery County. Here's what we found. We, we value education in Montgomery County, right? Everybody say right. Here's what we found. Same level of education, except on the west side, majority white, slightly more PhDs, not, not many, slightly more PhDs, but on the east side, uh, slightly more master's degrees, but relatively the same at high school and baccalaureate level. Triple the income difference in some places. That is not sustainable. And so I, I can't wait for us to get to the Q&A part, and I'm done now, because I want to contend with the Reverend um, uh, in love, uh, because I, I can see why HBCUs, black folks, Latino folks, Asian folks would be preoccupied with matters of economy. Right? Because you've done all the right things as far as education and things that are like and the social behaviors and graces and all that and still triple the income. And I will say to you, I agree with you 100%, we must diversify our economy here in Montgomery County or we die. And we're trying to do that in impact. See the t-shirt? They would kill me if I didn't show you this. Circle U, the People's University is a way that we're trying to do that in our own little way um, at Impact Silver Spring and be happy to talk more about that in the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just a, before we move on, a quick question. Everybody here knows what an HBCU is? Oh, yeah. Okay. So, historically, black college. It's a historically black colleges and universities. University. Okay. And okay. MS, MS, uh, Minority serving institutions, you may hear MSIs, which is okay. broader. Thank you. Okay, moving right along because I think the real value here is going to be the Q&A, uh, you know, at the end. So I'm going to move on to uh, Sarah Espinosa, who is the Director of Weather and Environment for the National Environmental Education Foundation. Right? <laughs> Sarah directs the Foundation's Earth Gauge program. Since 2005, she's worked with the American Meteorological Society. I had to practice that one for a while for some reason. <laughs> I've been practicing it for 10 years. And uh, broadcast meteorologists uh, across the U.S. Uh, to incorporate environmental and climate information into television broadcasts, weathercasts. Before joining the, the National Environmental Education Foundation, she worked with the educational programs at the World Wildlife Fund and the James Goodall Institute. The National Environmental Education Foundation is the nation's leading organization in lifelong environmental learning, connecting people to knowledge they can use to improve the quality of their lives and the health of the planet. The National Environmental Education Foundation was chartered by Congress in 1990 to advance environmental knowledge. Uh, it's my pleasure to present to you uh, Sarah Espinosa. So I wanted to start by saying I'm here with some colleagues today and we've been sitting out in the Green Fest uh, listening to people tell stories about how they connect with the environment. Who got them interested? What inspires them to think about the environment? Any closer? Oh, sure. Sorry. It's for interpreting purposes. We have to hear it over ourselves to be able to interpret things. Um, and we've heard some really great stories people going on hikes with their father when they were kids and picking blueberries. A mother who saw um, plastic bags in the Anacostia and wanted to engage her kids in environmental ed so that they're living in a better place. And I think those stories are really nice examples of what we're all about at NEEF, which is helping people connect to the environment in a way that's meaningful to them. Um, as Sterling said, we are a national organization, national nonprofit organization. Um, we're the leading organization in lifelong environmental education. So we talk to everyone from kindergartners to um, adults. And just this year, we have shared a new vision that by 2022, 300 million Americans 
will actively use environmental information to ensure the well-being of the Earth and its people. And in order to get to 300 million Americans, we really need to be reaching out to a broad um, range of people and organizations, government agency partners, nonprofit partners, individuals, to get everyone engaged in um, thinking about the environment. So today I just want to share a couple of examples of ways that we're doing that, ways we're going to the 300 million. Um, starting with a project that's happening right here in the Mid-Atlantic, uh, Maryland, D.C., and Virginia, where we have been working with a group called the Hispanic Communications Network to de develop a series of radio spots that are airing on uh, Spanish language radio stations throughout the region. And the spots are really great. Um, they use storytelling, it's just a minute, it's a really quick hit, storytelling to convey to people environmental information about the Chesapeake Bay region. So it could be um, a story about uh, checking up on your neighbors during an extreme heat wave and understanding how weather impacts our health. Uh, we've done a story about a family that gets to a Maryland beach and realizes it's closed because of, because of water quality and learns something from the lifeguard about how they can protect the water. So it's these little connections that people may be making in their communities and we're providing ways that they can actually start to think about and address those problems. One of the other things we're doing here in the greater DC region is we're working with healthcare providers uh, to actually prescribe nature to their patients. So we have Dr. Robert Zarr uh, at Unity, Unity Healthcare uh, here in the DC area, which serves about 40% of DC's underserved communities. Um, is that better? Okay. Um, and he is actually prescribing nature to his pediatric patients so that when they come visit him, he's saying, get outside for 60 minutes. Here are some places in your community where you can go to connect with nature, even if it's just a local park, even if it's walking down the street or getting out in your backyard. There's ways to connect anywhere that you live. Um, kind of a different angle on diversity, we're working on reaching sports fans. Um, and this is an interesting one, uh, working with groups like the Green Sports Alliance that represents 170 teams around the country, 15 different leagues. And one example of the work that we've done is we've teamed up with National Weather Service and aired a series of short um, PSA spots at NASCAR's Brickyard 400 race. So NASCAR fans um, who were tailgating and watching the Jumbotron were actually seeing messages about um, things that were relevant to what they were what were happening that day. Inflate your tires on your car for better gas mileage. Recycle your can when you're tailgating. Um, you're outside. Make sure that you're prepared for severe weather. So some of these things that are really connecting to people where they are, which I think was a message you delivered, Reverend, which is really important. Um, the last thing I'll say is that the stories we were capturing out at GreenFest today are going to become part of a new website that's launching in a few weeks called My Earth Changing Moments. This is another piece of the 300 million. We're asking everyone to come to the website and share their story about how they connected with the environment. It's really a way to build community and start to build a dialogue with people from all different walks of life, all different parts of the country, sharing how they connect and why this is important to them. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, moving right along, our next uh, panelist and speaker is Jose, Jose Dominguez, who's the Executive Director of Pyramid Atlantic uh, Art Center. Jose brings more than 15 years of experience in nonprofit management and youth program development to his position. Jose received his BA from Southern Methodist University and his MFA in Fine Arts from the Tisch School at New York University. Pyramid Atlantic, this word again, empowers artists educates and unites communities through the process of printmaking, book arts, and digital media. Jose will share his views on integrating arts and sustainability in communities. Thanks, Jose. Thank you, sir. Wow, this is like a great group of people up here. You know, like when you're on one of those panels and you're like, man, how did, how did I get up here? <laughs> <laughs> everybody here is so great. So uh, I'm going to do my best. 
So uh, I'm the executive director of Pyramid Atlantic Arts Center, and what we do is we build communities, using the community word again, building communities that give life to paper making, print making, and artist books. And so, um, so how do I, how did I find myself in the middle of the the green, the green fest and the green green movement? Well, about a year ago, um, I went to a Silver Spring Green meeting and I uh, had this idea about recycling bins, you know, and so it was a little bit of self-interest and then a little bit of public interest, right? The self-interest is I'm an artist, I work with artists, so any opportunity I have to promote the arts, I'm going to take advantage of because if I don't bring it up, I always figure no one will, so I might as well do it. So what's Silver Spring Green meeting, and I put the PowerPoint presentation together and I said, let's have artists design recycling bins to put in downtown Silver Spring. Like, wouldn't this just be great? Uh, and it was. And like many uh, things, uh, you know, they can be a little challenging. Uh, and uh, there is, you know, there's good news, and then there's the news that's not good. That's not good. So uh, the news that's not good is, unfortunately, we weren't able to do it uh, permanently. We did a temporary uh, blue recycling bin uh, art project in downtown Silver Spring, uh, where we had some students from the middle school and some artists design recycling bins. They were put out, um, and that was and that was really great. And 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 why is that great? Like I'll tell you, um, because the arts. I find is is one of the few places that people from different walks of life, uh, different incomes, uh, genders, race, you name it, come together. Right? We disagree about so many things. Right? You mean you name it, religion, politics. I mean, you name it. Right? Where you're from, but the arts are where we all come together. And the arts are a way to sometimes talk about something without people getting their hands up in the air, like, oh, well, now you're attacking my point of view. It's like, no, I'm just appreciating the art. I'm really just appreciating what's here. So, so that's, what, that's what the idea uh, was about. And through it, we were able to do um, something else that the Reverend said today, which I thought was really great. We were able to empower uh, artists and young people at, uh, at Pyramid and at Loiterman Middle School where we worked to, uh, to learn something new and to apply their craft in a different way. Uh, because everyone loves to learn something. You know, everyone does. And always the trick is, how am I going to teach you something without you knowing I'm going to teach you something? Because if I do, then you're not going to want to learn it just because you don't want to show me that I actually taught you something. Um, but we were able to empower artists to see their art in another way, right? All of a sudden, they become stakeholders in the community because now this is their recycling bin, their piece of art that they've created that is part of their community, and now they're a stakeholder. And the same thing with in involving you know, the young people. Now they're not just served by these programs because a lot of times we think of young people, let's do service to them, right? Let's serve young people. Let's not support them and give them opportunities to become engaged, we were able to do that with this project. And, and all of it, all of it was through the arts. And I think um, in terms of, of the Green Movement and in terms of, uh, you know, empowering others, the arts is, is such a, it's such a strong, strong way to do it. And um, we do it all the time in the arts community, you know. Um, there is an artist at Pyramid Atlantic who creates work from uh, recycled materials. So everything that he creates on his canvas, he finds. You know, so he's not out always buying supplies. Uh, he, he uses what he finds and, he's, and he applies that. You know, at, and that's one of the things that folks like in the artist community, you know, have always been able to do. Uh, because we tend sometimes, folks in the arts and folks who appreciate the arts, uh, you tend to find value sometimes in things that others throw away, right? I mean, that's, and that's really what sustainability and this green movement is all about, is finding value sometimes in things that others don't find value in. And so I think, you know, the arts community, we've always, we've always been there. That's where we live. And uh, I think I'll end it there, and I'll uh, listen to what some of the great folks yeah. have to say.
Thanks, Jose. Moving right along. Uh, our next speaker is Pastor Mark Greiner uh, from the uh, Tacoma Park Presbyterian Church. Uh, Pastor Greiner was ordained as a minister of the Word and Sacrament in 1992 and has served congregations in Ohio and New York before being called to Tacoma Presbyterian Church in 2007. I'd like to read, read something to you. We're having this discussion about diversity uh, that I found on the church's uh, website. And it reads, like a quilt that hangs in our sanctuary to commemorate our 100th anniversary, the congregation of the Tacoma Park Presbyterian Church reflects the diverse ethnic, cultural influences in today's urban community. We are African, Hispanic, Asian, and European American, Indian, African, Hispanic, Asian, European American. We are, we are elderly people, adults, family, young couples, singles, youth, children, and babies. We are welcoming to gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgendered individuals through our More Life commitment. The best way to experience the variety and warmth of our members is to attend the service on Sunday. Uh, that's diversity. Yeah. Thank you very much. And I applaud you. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. So I, I love that introduction for the church. I'm glad we've got that on our website. Haven't read it for a while. <laughs> I'm actually representing one particular um, aspect. That is the Tacoma Park Silver Spring Community Shared Kitchen. And part of what Reverend Yearwood was talking about was the absolute necessity of love. The absolute necessity of love for diversifying the movement. So what I want to talk about is the kitchen is an aspect, a, a way of manifesting, a way of embodying love. We fre frequently hear that God loves people, but we don't always say the words, God loves diversity. God loves biodiversity. Think about it for just a moment. Just think from the, from the tiniest level of microorganisms that exist all through us and all around us, sustaining life. The great proliferation of life, the bounty of all the different kinds of, of flowers and the extravagance of all the different kind of fragrances. God loves biodiversity. The book of nature tells us so. But it's not only the book of nature that tells us so, it's also the book of scriptures. So for instance, if we look at the story of Noah and the great ark and all the many animals in the ark, at least one of the things that that story tells us is that God lovingly sustains and cares for biodiversity. We come from many different communities. We come from many different traditions. Some of them are sacred. Some of them are secular. But whether our traditions are sacred or whether they're secular, it is so important for us to find those images, to find those stories that celebrate diversity, and then to practice ways of welcoming one another. Food is one of the most important ways we come together because everybody eats. <laughs> And food is at the center of so many different traditions, sacred and secular. So part of what we started to, to think about as a church is how food could be a way of connecting people. We started out and we took several different steps. Part of what we started out doing was community organizing with a number of partners, and I'd be glad to talk with you more about our partners during the Q&A time. With a lot of different partners, we did listening within our congregation and within our community to find out what are the, lo the inequalities going on right here that we can be addressing. And part of what we did at the same time was to do an asset-based assessment. Mm -hmm. You know, there, you can talk about needs. You have to talk about needs. You've got to identify what the needs are, but it's important to know what your assets are at the same time. And part of what we recognized as a congregation is that we have a, a, a commercial-grade kitchen, but we weren't really using it at all. And we started to realize, well, we could use this for the, for the larger community. And we started to define how we could have a community shared kitchen. So that was the whole community organizing piece. But then came a second piece, and that was the advocacy piece. Because you see, our, our church is right in the center of historic Tacoma Park. It's in a residential neighborhood. We were not zoned to have a kitchen that was opened up to the larger community. So, over a period of about a year, we advocated with the Montgomery County uh, Council to change the zoning laws so that houses of worship, fire stations, of other civic groups that may already have commercially graded kitchen in, uh, in residential neighborhoods can open up 
those kitchens for broader community use so long as they meet uh, neighborhood friendly kinds of guidelines. Oh. So community lots and lots and lots of conversations. Second was advocacy, and then was the step around defining, well, what would a, 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 a community kitchen be, be all about? Well, there are several different kinds of components that, that we need to, to, we realized we needed to talk about. Now, this wasn't at the origin of the conversation, but we need to realize where we are right now. We are at a hunger cliff as a nation. The House of Representatives has defunded what is normally called food stamps, it's SNAP. We are facing a cliff as a nation around hunger. It's very real. So part of what we realized is that we could be about hunger. How can we address it? One way, connecting farmers and people who are hungry. There already exists in our county something called the Farm to Freezer program. Farmers make more product, they, they, they grow more food sometimes and they can sell immediately. So rather than let the food spoil, it can be frozen and distributed to people who are hungry. The missing ingredient that, in that though is a commercially graded kitchen so that all of this can happen safely. We can be an ingredient in that. That's one piece. Second piece, um, uh, education. The Montgomery County uh, Department of Parks and Recreation and the Tacoma Park uh, Department of Parks and Recreation have been talking with young people, with teens, and realizing there's a strong interest around uh, nutrition and around learning how to cook. So the Departments of Recreation can run the programs. What they lack are kitchens. We can help out in that kind of a way. Age diversity. Second thing uh, around diversity, we want our kitchen, it's not yet built, but we want our kitchen to be American with Disabilities Act uh, uh, compliant. We have a, a, a large number of elderly people in our community. We want to make sure that our kitchen is available across age diversity as well. Another piece with this education uh, is around economic empowerment. Even before the, uh, the, the, the kitchen is up and running, we got something called a community development block grant so that we could be offering food handlers uh, training classes. You need a license to be a licensed food handler. So over this last year, we offered classes both in English and en Espanol so that people could get this training. About 30 people have gotten their licenses. Absolutely important for economic empowerment. And then the last piece, and really the keystone of all of this, is around being a micro-enterprise kitchen. Sliding scale micro-enterprise kitchen, because it doesn't matter where your ec economic income level is. If you want to start a food-related business, you need a commercially graded kitchen. There are almost none available in the whole of Montgomery County, and those that are available for rent really aren't affordable. Part of what our partners helped uh, identify for us is a strong interest, especially in low-income communities, around starting uh, uh, food-related businesses. But you've got to be able to have a kitchen to do it. That's where we think that we can, we can make a difference. What's the community piece? I'll, I'll, I'll just end on that. What can you all make of this? You may be part of houses of worship. You may be a part of a secular institution that has a commercially graded kitchen. We're hoping that what we're doing is a model that other people can follow as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pastor. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and uh, open it up to uh, to questions. Uh, who's going to go first? If you could stand up and speak loud, please. Okay. Now, this is specifically relating to the environmental education issue. Now, first of all, before you educate people about it, you need to have the information. And a lot of people want to help the environment. There are a lot of things people can do to help the environment. In fact, there are too many things people can do. There's no way they can do them all. Obviously, people should concentrate on the most effective things. What produces the greatest benefit? The least effort. But what are they? And that is a very tough question because you're comparing apples and oranges. You know, how is the relative effectiveness of recycling plastic bottles versus removing invasive plants? Well, uh, it's extremely difficult to figure that out, but these are the decisions people have to make every day, and we need to get the most accurate information we can get for people to act on. And I'm wondering, is anybody studying this? And I brought this up to various people, and generally the response is, it's a good question, and we don't really know what to do with it. <laughs> so, so on the... On the question of whether anybody's studying specifically what the most effective actions are, um, I, I, I don't know that I know the answer to that question, um, as others have, have told you. 
Um, what I can say is I think the way we look at that at NEEF is that we want everyone to feel like they're a part of the solution. So even if it's just recycling a can, which may not in the long term feel like it has a huge impact, if someone is feeling like they're a part of, sol of the solution by doing that, that's an important first step. Um, for someone else, it may be taking a big step like putting solar panels on their home, but we feel like there's, again, you go to people where they are, and if it's taking a first step that makes them feel like they're part of the solution, then that's just as important in some ways as, as the, the impact. So, I'm watching your body language, and I'm, with this beautiful answer that was, Sarah, I'm, I'm betting you're, you're, you're saying to yourself, that's the same answer I've been getting, basically. Well, that's not even an answer. Well, it is an answer, I'll say. It is an answer, but it's not the answer you want. So, let me show this circle to you. See that? See that? So, someone on the panel here, I think it was Jose, no, it was Pastor, talked about needs and assets, and I just want to switch it to aspirations. So, one of the things that we're doing, because we go door to door and we talk to folks about all kinds of things, and one of the things that we used to do is we used to ask folks, how are you doing? How's your neighbor doing? About 14,000 door knocks in, we changed the question. The question is, what is the thing that you know that you're supposed to be doing to make our world better? Here's what I would give back to you. If that's a, a question that's important to you that nobody is answering, maybe it's a question that you need to answer. And if you do, if you do, it'll, it'll first of all, it'll give you some satisfaction, but it'll also make our world better. Because I actually think it's a great question, and I'm sorry I don't have an answer either. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else have anything to add? Uh, we have another question? One more question. Um, Jose, you, you, you spoke about art, uh, and, and uh, to me, art is probably a universal way of expressing yourself that you can't do anywhere else. And it involves your own feelings and your creativity. And so, how can we take our children? and sensitize them or make them aware in a positive way, not the good and the bad, the fighting the war and there's good people and bad people, good causes and bad causes. How can we, in a positive way, teach kids uh, about environmental issues and climate change and the need to love nature uh, in the present school system? Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Wow, how much time you got? <laughs> and, then, and no one brought me beer for this conversation. Um, well, you know, like here would be my advice, because we do a lot of work with young people. We do a lot of arts education. And I'll tell you like what I have found uh, to be most effective when working with young people is uh, get out of their way. Mm -hmm. yep. You know, young people, I have found, especially the younger, young, have just kind of an innate sense of creativity and an innate sense of the world and of the environment. And I find that as teachers and as parents, uh, the best thing we can do is get out of their way, uh, support them, and give them the tools to go further. You know, whether it's, you know, paints and paper and uh, blocks or whatever they need to construct to spending more time outdoors because, you know, young people are naturally curious. And so, as an adult, I'd say, within the present school system is um, empower them to make choices. And that's one of the things we do in an after school program that we run uh, after school. Uh, it's really about the young people making choices because I feel during the day, uh, and most of their lives, young people don't have the opportunity to make choices. Choices are made for them. Parents make choices, teachers make choices, principals make choices, politicians make choices. Young people don't have a chance to make any choice. So what we do in our after school program is, here's your two hours, this is all we have, but what do you want to do? How do you want to use this material? And then I'm going to support you, we're going to support you. That's what I would say. Yeah. So, y'all know that question comes up a lot, and it's, we should always be thinking about how our children develop. Um, and we do some of the youth work. We all do, I'm sure, one way or another. 
But I often feel like, and Bernard, I'm not saying you're saying this, but I often feel like when we talk about programming for the children, we're letting the adults off the hook, right? And I actually think that we need to do some of this art stuff with the adults, right? I mean, we need to go to Rockville and some of these skyscrapers and we need to just do the same kinds of things there, right? Because guess what? Um, I'm looking around the room, guessing at some of the generations here. We grew up in it, many of us, when we didn't have like flat screen TVs, PlayStations, Sega, well Sega, Sega, we probably did have Sega, but we didn't have as much, we didn't have the internet, none of that stuff. So we were the kids who were outside. We were the kids that were playing in the dirt. We were the kids that were doing, you know, playing with putty and play and Stretch Armstrong, remember Stretch Armstrong, and all of those things, right? And we're still here. Right? And so I would just submit that there are some things that are, that are very fundamental, right? Um, that for some reason we aren't getting at, right, as a community. I think the arts is a way to unlock that, uh, but uh, we, 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 we aren't there yet. We often, I just want to caution us, we run to our young people as the hope for the future. We were all young yet, and the future, we were all young at one moment, and the future is here. And things are better in many ways, but they're also still broken in many ways. So I'd like to, as much as we want to invest in our kids, and we should, I also want to challenge the adults to do something uh, new and good as well. All right. Thanks, Ronnie. And uh, I'd like to uh, thank you. We're done. Yeah. We're over no. time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, that's what happens when you have a good conversation. I'd like to thank all the panelists for participating and thank you for joining us and we'll hope you'll join us again next year. Well, thank you.